Welcome back to Logic. This video covers the rest of the replacement rules for natural deduction proofs. Transposition is a rule that lets you move from a conditional to its logical contrapositive. So that's where you flip around the antecedent and the consequent and add a negation or remove a negation to each. You can go in either direction in this as in the other replacement rules. So um, the antecedent, if it switches with the consequent, both the antecedent and the consequent have to either gain a negation or lose a negation. If you only have a case where the antecedent itself or the consequent only has the negation, then in order to use this rule, you will add a negation to each side. So you're always either adding a negation to both sides or subtracting a negation from both sides. Here's a natural language example. If the US sends troops to Africa to fight Islamic extremists, then there will be US casualties in Africa. That's logically equivalent to if there are no US casualties in Africa, then the US will not have sent troops to Africa to fight Islamic extremists. Material implication is a rule that lets you convert a conditional to a disjunction or vice versa. However, when you convert the conditional to the disjunction, the first disjunct has to have a negation or tilde on it. You could also start from the disjunction and move to the conditional but the first disjunct must have a tilde on it. And then the antecedent of the conditional, in this case, P, loses the tilde when it goes to the conditional. If you wanted to use this rule in a case where you have just a disjunction like P wedge Q, where there's no negations, you can still use it, but first you have to use the double negation rule to add two tildes before the first disjunct. And then after you use this rule, one of the tildes will be removed when you convert it into a conditional or a horseshoe. So for example, if you had the proposition tilde tilde P wedge Q and you use this rule on it, it would become tilde P horseshoe Q. Here's a natural language example. If Donald Trump is president of the United States, then he is commander in chief of the US armed forces. That is logically equivalent to Donald Trump is not president of the United States or he is commander in chief of the US armed forces. Material equivalence allows you to convert from a triple bar or logical equivalence to either a wedge of conjunctions or a dot of conditionals. And you can see there are two versions of this rule. Um, and remember, as with the other rules, the double arrow means you can go in either direction. So it also allows you to build up a triple bar proposition if you have a wedge or a dot that is a disjunction or a conjunction that match the other operators. So if we look at the wedge, the first disjunct is P dot Q. So you're saying P and Q are true or the second disjunct is the conjunction of the negations of those. And this makes sense logically because what the triple bar means, what if and only if means is that Either they're both true or they're both false. The second version of this allows you to go from a conjunction of conditionals. Those conditionals are logical converses of each other. P horseshoe Q versus Q horseshoe P. So if you have both of those conditionals in a conjunction, that's logically equivalent to P if and only if Q. Because if you think about the meaning of the triple bar, it's saying both if P then Q and if Q then P. So that's why this rule makes sense. Here's a natural language example. Kurdistan will become an independent nation if and only if the US permits it. That's logically equivalent to if Kurdistan becomes an independent nation, then the US permits it. And if the US permits it, then Kurdistan will become an independent nation. Exportation is a rule that lets you move from a conditional that has a conjunction as the antecedent to a conditional that has a conditional as a consequent. The reason why this rule makes sense intuitively is because if you have the proposition if P and Q then are, 
then that's logically equivalent to saying if P is true, then if Q is true, then R will be true. So in other words, if P, then if Q, then R is like saying if both P and Q are true, then R will be true. Here's a natural language example. If the US and Iran will continue to interfere in Iraq, then Iraq will continue to be unstable. That is logically equivalent to the following proposition. If the US continues to interfere in Iraq, then if Iran continues to interfere in Iraq, then Iraq will continue to be unstable. And this is a rule to keep out on the look for because if you see a conditional that has a conjunction as its antecedent, or if you see a conditional that has another conditional as its consequent, you should be thinking maybe I can use exportation on that line of the proof. Tautology is a rule that lets you move from a simple proposition P or well, really any proposition P at a simpler compound to a disjunction of P as the first disjunct and P again as the second disjunct. Now, if you move from P to P wedge P, you could also do, it, do that using the addition rule. However, tautology allows you to go in the other direction. It allows you to eliminate one of the disjuncts, but only if the disjuncts are identical. So P wedge P can also be converted to just P. There's a second version of tautology that works the same way, but instead of using the wedge, it uses the dot. And logically, the reason why this makes sense is because if you say either P is true or P is true, that's the same basic meaning as saying that P is true. And likewise, if you say both P is true and P is true, that's a kind of redundancy there. It's the same as just asserting P. So here's a natural language example. Russia bought Facebook ads in an attempt to influence the 2016 US presidential election. That's logically equivalent to either Russia bought Facebook ads in an attempt to influence the election or Russia bought Facebook ads in an attempt to influence the election. So here's a summary of the second five replacement rules. Transposition allows you to move from a conditional P horseshoe Q to swapping the antecedent with the consequent and you add a tilde to the antecedent and to the consequent, or you subtract a tilde from both the antecedent and the consequent. Material implication allows you to go from a horseshoe to a wedge, from a conditional to a disjunction, or vice versa. However, the antecedent must match the first disjunct, except to have one fewer negation, and the consequent must match the second disjunct. Material equivalence allows you to go back and forth between a triple bar and either a disjunction of conjunctions or a conjunction of conditionals. And you have to match the exact order of those propositions and those operators. So if you go from a, a triple bar to a disjunction, then the first disjunct has to be a conjunction of those two propositions in the triple bar. The second disjunct has to be a conjunction of their negations. And likewise, if you move to the dot or the conjunction from a triple bar, it has to be the first of those propositions, horseshoe the second, and the second horseshoe the first. Um, and of course, as with all the other rules, you can go in the opposite direction as well. For exportation, this allows you to move from a conditional whose antecedent is a conjunction to another conditional where the con consequent is a conditional and where you remove a second conjunct from the antecedent and place it in the consequent. Tautology allows you to eliminate a kind of redundant proposition if you have P wedge P or P dot P, or it allows you to add uh, um, a proposition if you're going in the other direction. Now, another thing I'll point out about tautology is that in addition to the um, upper version partially re um, capsulating the addition rule. Addition would also allow you to go from P to P wedge P, but you can't go in the opposite direction from P wedge P to P using addition. So that's why we need tautology. Similarly, if you look at the bottom version of it, going from P dot P to just P, um, simplification would let you do that as well. You could go from P dot P to just P using simplification. However, you could not go in the opposite direction. Simplification would not allow you to go from P to P dot P. So that's another reason why we need the tautology rule as its own rule. Now let's do some sample problems. The first few will be filling in the blank. So we're given one premise and another that follows from it logically. And we have to name the rule of that we can use to derive that second premise. 
So if you look at the first premise, S dot R parentheses horseshoe Q, you can notice a pattern. Those same simple propositions S and R are in line two of the proof, but S has been exported out of the parentheses. So yes, that does imply we can use the exportation rule to derive that line of the proof. Another problem, moving from a horseshoe to a wedge where we have the first dot disjunct have a negation added to it. That is the material implication rule. Another problem, we have one line of the proof R wedge R, the next line just R by itself. So there's only one rule that we can use to derive that. And that is tautology. And remember for tautology, in order for it to work, it cannot be just any old disjunction. The first disjunct has to match the second exactly. Another sample problem. We have a disjunction or wedge. The first disjunct is a conjunction R and S and the second disjunct is a conjunction of their negations. So if we use the material equivalence rule on line one, what do we get? It becomes simply R triple bar S because this is the same as saying that um, R and S have the same truth value. So if one's true, the other's true. If one's false, the other's false, which is what the triple bar means. So now we're moving from line one of the proof. We have a conjunction Q dot Q. We're using tautology on line one. So what do we get? We get just Q by itself. We also could have used simplification in the same way. Another practice problem, this one we have a conditional whose consequent is another conditional. So if we use exportation on line one, what do we get? The second antecedent S joins the first antecedent R in a conjunction that together this conjunction is the antecedent of this conditional. So now we're going to do a proof that involves one implication rule and one replacement rule. The first uh, premise is T wedge S, the second is tilde tilde R, and we're supposed to use those to prove T wedge S parentheses dot R. So how can we do this in two steps? Well, the first step is to notice that our conclusion has only R, whereas our premise has tilde tilde R. So we can use double negation to remove both of those tildes. And now it only takes one more step to get to the conclusion. We can use conjunction on lines one and three to form a conjunction where T wedge S is the first conjunct and R is the second conjunct. Another proof using one implication and one replacement rule. Our conclusion is supposed to be S horseshoe parentheses R dot Q close parentheses. So you'll notice we have a gap between the premises and the conclusion. There's a P that's in the premises that's not in the conclusion. So hopefully this would give you an idea for how you can set yourself up to derive that conclusion. The first step is to use implication on line two to turn it into a conditional. So we're basically setting ourselves up for using another rule with lines one and three, but ultimately we wanna get rid of that P. So what's the other rule we can use to get the conclusion? We have to use hypothetical syllogism. Hypothetical syllogism allows us to go from two conditionals, one of which has a consequent identical to the antecedent of the other. In this case, P is the consequent of line one, and P is also the antecedent of line three. So we can eliminate the middleman, so to speak. We're left with the new conditional that has S as the antecedent and R dot Q in parentheses as the consequent. So here's a proof that allows us to take any number of steps we need to get to the conclusion using all of the implication and the first five replacement rules, or rather all the replacement rules. So we have um, one premise, Q wedge R, the other is a conjunction of conditionals where Q and R are the antecedents, and we're trying to derive P. You can see P in the consequence of those two conditionals in the conjunction on line two, but it's embedded in a bunch of other compound propositions with lots of other operators. So how can we extract P by itself? Well, you'll notice that pattern. It's very distinctive. We have one premise, it's a disjunction Q wedge R. The other is a conjunction of conditionals, the antecedents of which match those two disjuncts. So what rule does that set us up for? The answer is constructive dilemma. So this allows us to turn uh, lines one and two into a disjunction where we have the consequent of those two conditionals, S dot P and P dot L as the disjuncts. 
So we're getting closer to having P by itself, but we're not quite there. What is the next step of this proof? If you notice, P occurs in both of the disjuncts. So what we want to do is set ourselves up for using another rule. We're going to put, we're going to use commutation to put P at the beginning of the first conjunction. Um, and so now P is the first conjunct in both of the um, disjuncts, sorry, in both of the conjunctions that we have in our disjuncts. So this should remind you of another rule we can use to get closer to having P by itself on a line. And that rule is distribution. Distribution allows us to go from a wedge of conjunctions to a conjunction if the first conjunct of each of those conjunctions is identical, which it is here. That's why we had to reverse the order of S and P from line three to line four using commutation to set ourselves up for the format of a distribution rule. So what rule can we use next to derive just P by itself? We can use simplification, which allows us to take one conjunct out of a conjunction, and we've reached our conclusion. Another proof using all implication and replacement rules. We're trying to get Q wedge S from those two premises. We don't see S in the premises. So what rule could we use to introduce it? You should be able to think of that. If not, uh, I'll reveal it in the next couple of minutes. So th the first goal though is to get Q by itself. So then we can introduce S after the wedge. And so we wanna focus on lines one and two to think how can we get Q by itself? We notice Q the tilde Q is the antecedent of a conditional. And there is a rule we can use to try to isolate the antecedent of a conditional. And that is modus tollens. If we had the negation of the consequent, which is tilde P, then we could use modus tollens to get the negation of the antecedent. However, our other premise is not the negation of tilde P, it's just P by itself. So we have to use double negation to introduce two tildes in front of P. Now we can use modus tollens with lines one and three. When we do that, we get tilde tilde Q because we have to add another tilde to the antecedent. That's just the format of modus tollens. In this case, we already had a tilde on our antecedent tilde Q. So it becomes tilde tilde Q. So now we have to use double negation again to get Q by itself, because if you look at our conclusion, it doesn't have tilde tilde Q, it just has Q. So now there's only one step remaining we have to do to get from Q to Q wedge S. And that is the addition rule, which lets us add a wedge to any proposition we have by itself in the line of a proof, and then anything we want after the wedge. So let's look at another proof using all implication and replacement rules. We're trying to derive not R until they are from those two premises. You can see R in the antecedent of the second conditional in line two. So we want to strategize. How can we start to get R closer to being by itself? We know that if we had Q on its own line, we could use Q with line two and modus ponens to get R horseshoe P by itself, which would not get us all the way to till they are, but it would get us closer. So that implies we should use simplification on line one to get Q by itself on line three. And then we can use modus ponens on lines two and three to derive our horseshoe P. Now, this is the general strategy of when you're trying to prove just one simple proposition, or in this case, the negation of a simple proposition R, you wanna to try to isolate R by itself, and that will help you get closer to the conclusion. So now we're trying to get rid of that horseshoe P. And how can we do that? Well, if we had the negation of P, we could use modus tollens with those two premises to derive tilde R, but we don't yet have tilde P by itself. We have to use simplification on line one to derive the first conjunct of that conjunction. And now that sets us up for using modus tollens on lines four and five to get our final conclusion tilde R. Another proof, this one again using all implication and replacement rules. We're trying to derive tilde S from the premises. We see that S is by itself as the antecedent of a conditional. This implies ideally we would like to use, or we could use potentially modus tollens um, with premise two to derive tilde S. Um, however, we first have to use distribution on line one. You'll notice we do have P wedge T in line one, but it's um, embedded in another, um, we have a, 
t embedded in the conjunction in the second disjunct. But if you remember the distribution rule, it matches the form of line one. So we can go from a disjunct, a disjunction that has its second disjunct as a conjunction or dot, to a dot that has two disjunctions as disjuncts. P gets repeated as the first disjunct in each of those disjunctions on line three. And then what were previously the two conjuncts, T and R, those become the second disjunct. And you'll notice we're getting closer to having P wedged T by itself, we can use potentially with line two. First, however, we have to use simplification to isolate P wedge T from line three. I noticed that I've left the parentheses on P wedge T. That was a mistake, it's a redundancy. This is technically a well-formed formula, but because those parentheses are not necessary, you do not have to include them. The final step of the proof is adding two tildes in front of P wedge T. So this will set us up for using modus tollens with line two, because in order to do that, we have to have the negation of our consequent tilde parentheses P wedge T close parentheses. Because that consequent already has a tilde on it, in order to use modus tollens, we have to add the second tilde. So now that we've set ourselves up, we just use modus tollens on lines two and five, and we derive our final conclusion, tilde S.